our world and beyond. Space, in partnership with the European Space Agency. We concur, Andre, the vehicle is... May 25, 2012. The first commercial spacecraft is about to berth with the ISS. A private company achieves something only national agencies did before, an orbital payload delivery. Reliability has actually been our, our primary goal, um, but then an important secondary goal is to um, advance, f figure out technology innovations and advancements that uh, effectively reduce the cost of, of space transport, uh, and we have a, a large number of those. Um, the, the, the really huge breakthrough that's needed is uh, rapid and complete reusability, uh, just like aircraft. So the Expedition 31 crew getting their first look inside this uh, brand new... As the ISS crew birthed and unloaded the Dragon capsule, one question remained. Can the California-based SpaceX company make a profit by recovering and reusing spaceships and carrier rockets? So far, SpaceX has been 50% funded by NASA, which spends hundreds of millions of dollars stimulating the development of commercial orbital transport. Private companies are going to take responsibility for getting NASA astronauts and others to the International Space Station and other low Earth orbit destinations, and that's a big deal. For decades, NASA has relied on private companies to build vehicles and other tailor-made components for its space program. Now the White House plans to outsource all simple orbital tasks to the private sector. NASA will focus on researching into breakthroughs in space exploration, leaving commercial companies to design and operate their own spacecraft. Hubble is one of the most phenomenal things we've ever done in space. Buying the services of space transportation rather than the vehicles themselves, we can continue to ensure rigorous safety standards are met, but we will also accelerate the pace of innovations as companies, from young startups to established leaders, compete to design and build and launch new means of carrying people and materials out of our atmosphere. In Europe, there are several private-public partnerships, limited so far to satellite telecommunications. But the role of private companies is expected to grow as the sector matures. It's normal that um, initially uh, it's a field of activity that's been new and requires a very significant government uh, support. But at some point, uh, it is uh, strong enough so that it can depend on the companies looking for opportunities and looking for models and they are not only dependent on institutional funding. Private American companies benefit from NASA's scientific legacy by taking over abandoned projects, such as inflatable space habitats, which were developed by NASA until Congress cancelled the TransHab program in 2000. Bigelow Aerospace uses the same principle for its own commercial space station. NASA really only conceived of the idea of expandable habitats, and this is a problem, frankly, that has plagued the agency of late, which is PowerPoint engineering, that they come up with an idea, and then Congress gets in the way and prevents it from coming to fruition. So NASA came up with the idea, but it really was left to us to implement certainly all of the details in the engineering. The company has launched two prototypes to demonstrate how inflatable modules provide vast living space while protecting the crew from radiation and debris. Bigelow plans to cooperate with SpaceX and other transporters to send private customers to orbital habitats for a fraction of the ISS rental cost, a goal simplified by there being no regulations restricting orbital activities. It's very easy right now, in as much as there is no technically on-orbit authority for any entity within the federal government. 
you have the FAA AST, which is the commercial space wing of the FAA, regulating what goes up and what goes down. But currently, there is no regulatory regime in orbit. So far, space operations are governed by rules based on the UN conventions agreed in the 60s and 70s. In particular, this space law assigns liability for any damage caused by a space object, private or not, to the launching state. I think you can see the involvement of the private sector in two ways. First, as contractors to space agencies. And uh, it's not what we see now with the International Space Station, where a private company brings its own launcher for cargo uh, at the station. And so there, I would say, uh, the space agencies keep a certain control on the activity. Now, with private uh, individuals and company having mean the means to go to outer space with their private launcher they will i believe in 10 15 years from now develop their own scenario for space exploration and this i would say is an activity which will still be regulated by the state because at the end the state is responsible is liable for any damage but uh, it will be up to private individuals to decide what kind of scenario what kind of operations they want to uh, conduct in space in Colorado, yet another abandoned project is making an impressive comeback. The Dream Chaser was first designed by NASA as a lifeboat for an emergency return from a space station. Now it is being aerodynamically tested to become a space taxi, a reusable vehicle to carry people to and from low Earth orbit. This configuration, this shape, this lifting body, came from a Russian heritage design called the Bohr 4. This was uh, seen and analyzed by the NASA Langley Research Center, and they decided this vehicle had some very nice characteristics. It's very stable, it's inherently stable, so when you return through the atmosphere, it doesn't require a lot of control to keep it flying properly. So they did thousands of hours of work on it. When uh, our company decided to uh, pick up a vehicle to begin using, we thought it was not very smart to start with a clean sheet of paper, but let's use something that NASA has already put a lot of effort and research into. We went to them and asked for the information, the results of all their testing, and they provided that as they should as a government agency to allow private industry to try to take the value of the money that's been invested by the government and take advantage of that. Expected to fly in 2014, the Dream Chaser will be launched vertically and will glide to return. It will be like the Space Shuttle, but safer, thanks to its top rocket takeoff, non-toxic fuel and built-in launch escape system. What we see ourselves doing in this program is being able to work on developing a system for LEO transportation that would be run by commercial companies like us with a lot of help and assistance from NASA. That would allow NASA to focus in on the more challenging and difficult missions, perhaps going to an asteroid or going back to the moon or maybe someday to Mars. Along with comprehensive research and expertise, the Dream Chaser has received $100 million of public funding from NASA to stimulate commercial space transportation. So far, um, space agencies um, have been um, sort of taken by the hand, the companies, and telling them exactly specifying what they wanted to achieve and how they wanted to achieve it. Now, uh, we're moving to a, a model, or at least in certain, uh, certain sectors, in which we can see that we can define a certain target, an objective, and then let a company, uh, industry, uh, work towards this objective. The future of space tourism, another promising field in the private space sector, takes shape in the new Mexican desert, where the world's first purpose-built commercial spaceport is getting ready to service suborbital flights. Designed by Foster and Partners with environmental sustainability in mind, Spaceport America borrows plenty of restricted airspace from the adjacent military missile range. This is a terminal and a hangar all in one facility. Um, the two hangars are on either side and they can house up to two of the carrier um, uh, craft, which is called White Knight 2. The 
business model is very interesting because um, uh, we, uh, up till now, have had state money, uh, tax bond money, to build out the spaceport. By 2014, we need to be totally self-supporting. So the way we're doing that is to diversify our business model. We'll get some of our revenue through our space launch customers, but the other part will be through tourism and visitors that come and experience um, Spaceport America. The Virgin Galactic Company has chosen the spaceport for its home base. The carbon composite space planes will lift tourists 100 kilometers above the Earth, where space officially begins. A few minutes of unforgettable views and weightlessness will cost a relatively modest $200,000. Hundreds of people are already on a waiting list for a ticket, with the first customers expected to take off in less than two years. We knew that there were many people around the world that had dreamt about going to space, had expected to be able to go to space, and yet, you know, 40, 50 years after man first went to space, we were still in the situation where just a handful of government employees had had the opportunity. And that was a very sort of classic Richard Branson business, I suppose, of, uh, of, of, of looking at something where there was demand that was being badly served, and, uh, you know, we felt that perhaps we could do something about it. The name is... <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> the tourist vessel will start its ascent attached to the carrier mothership before separating and continuing the flight using its own rocket engine. In the future, such suborbital flight could become a common means of global transportation. Eventually, I would expect there'll be many more spaceports because ultimately we'd like point-to-point -point space travel just like we do in airline, the airline industry today. Commercial spacefaring is expanding, but there are still many challenges to overcome before private companies can make profit by providing reliable, affordable transport and accommodation in space.